Hello, everyone, and welcome to Training Thursday with the Stoplight Customer Success Team. My name is Cheryl, and I'm joined by my colleague, Amy. And together, we're going to be your hosts for today's training session. So as we get started, we're going to turn off our cameras so you can actually focus on the presentation. So just a few notes about the logistics of the webinar. First, if you have any questions during the presentation today, feel free to post them in the QA window. We have people monitoring the window and they'll respond to those questions that are asked. At the conclusion of the webinar, we will post the questions and the answers in the Stoplight community in Discord. Second, during Amy's tour of the Workspace user interface, I will be posting some uh, product documentation links in the chat window. So I invite you to click on those, bookmark them so you can reference them later. The documentation will help you better understand the feature as well as how to implement it in your workspace. If you have any questions, please ask those in the QA window and that will minimize confusion for all the participants. Finally, for those of you watching the recording version of this training session, you can find the posted links in the video description below. And if you have any questions while viewing the recording, you can join us in the Stoplight community in Discord and use the training tag to post your questions. The purpose of today's training is to review some key Stoplight concepts and walk through an overview of the Stoplight workspace interface. Uh, I will be starting the session today with a quick overview of how the Stoplight platform can assist you and your organization with your API development needs. And from there, we will review a few key concepts that will help you navigate the platform. Then Amy will introduce us to the Stoplight workspace user interface and review the features and settings. So let's take a quick look at the key uh, features of Stoplight that can help you and your organization enhance your API development process. Stoplight's API design features allow you to develop quality APIs with a collaborative approach to an API design first philosophy. It helps create and prototype your APIs using our intuitive visual editor for open API specifications. You can create an API in line with industry best practices. Discussions allows members to add comments, ask questions, and interact with the Studio interface. Discussions also integrates with popular task tools like Jira and Slack to help the facilitation of collaboration between uh, outside workspace users as well. Our newly released catalog API makes it easy to access your bundled references with long-lived workspace tokens. Catalog API consumers can safely integrate directly with their CICD pipeline to facilitate testing, SDK generation, and API gateway configuration. With Stoplight's API mocking features, you can instantly create a mock version of your API-based on your open API specifications. This allows you to visualize and get feedback on your API designs before spending time on backend development. API mocking allow, also allows for front-end client application developers and backend service development teams to develop their projects in parallel. With Stoplight's API documentation features, you can provide a top-notch developer experience for internal and external consumers through, the, uh, through automatically generated documentation based on your open API files. This will help internal and external users discover, learn, and integrate with your APIs quickly by publishing interactive API documentation, tutorials, and code samples that are always up to date. And finally, Stoplight's governance features allow you to govern your APIs at scale with an always in sync central repository of API designs, schemas, and API documentation. You can easily share, apply, and enforce standards across all of your API designs to provide consistency, reusability, and better governance throughout your API program. You can utilize Stoplight's public style guides to leverage sets of curated API design rules from top companies around security and design themes. 
and the component libraries, which is formally known as design libraries, can create projects that contain data models that you can reuse across API projects in your workspace. And using the proposals feature, you can see recent API design changes at a glance and keep track of changes across your Git connected projects. So now that we've reviewed how Stoplight can enhance your API development process, let's take a minute to review some of the key concepts to understand within Stoplight. The first concept to understand is roles within Stoplight. While workspace roles are focused on access for managing settings and changes at the workspace level, which is set in your members tab, projects and team roles are focused on a level of access within an individual project. I'm not going to dive into the specific descriptions and permissions of each of the workspace and the project roles at this time, but I highly would recommend that you become familiar with these roles by visiting our documentation pages. The second concept that we're going to look at is groups and teams. Groups provides a way to organize projects for easy navigation and maintenance. For example, you can group similar projects together or you can separate public projects from internal projects. And you can also separate projects into various organizational groups. Teams, this feature allows you to manage user accesses to projects. It allows organizations to easily manage which users have access to stoplight projects, as well as controlling project permissions. This simplifies the process of allowing users to collaborate on projects while giving administrators more security over access controls. Finally, let's look at the hierarchy within Stoplight and the two main user interfaces that you will encounter. Within Stoplight, you have the workspace and the studio interface. Your hierarchy begins with your workspace. Within your workspace, you will establish the look and the feel, and all, uh, as well as all of the settings and the integrations with your Git repos and single sign-on options. You will also create and manage your members and projects within your workspace interface. And in Studio, you will create and manage your different API projects, style guides, and component library projects. Within any API project, you may have one or many API designs and open API specifications, endpoints, models and schemas, documentation articles, and applied style guides. As a member begins to navigate through the different groups and into individual projects, they will see the docs view of each project. In the docs view, a member can learn more about each project and based on the member's granted rights, they may move into editing the selected project. This will transform them from the workspace to the studio interface. When you transition between your individual stoplight projects, you will navigate back or navigate from studio back to the workspace where you can select a new project and head back into studio to edit the specific project, project artifacts associated with that project. Your technical team and API design architects will likely be spending a majority of their time within the Studio UI. Today, we will be focusing on the workspace user interface and how owners and admins can configure the look and feel of the workspace. So now that we understand how Stoplight can help you, uh, your API designs and how to navigate through it, I will hand it over to Amy, who's going to walk through a, a tour of the workspace interface and show us how owners and admins will interact. So it's all yours, Amy. Thanks, Cheryl. I'd like to start today by looking at our workspace from a pre-authenticated point of view. So there's three things I want to point out. First, you'll notice we're not signed in. But here we've got our landing page or our home page. This is something that is configurable, and we'll look at how to do that when we get into our settings tab. The second thing I want to point out is the fact that we see some projects here. Um, these are public projects, meaning anyone has the ability to access the documentation for these projects and can learn more about the specific API and um, the codes related to that. Um, and finally, the 
authentication screen. So the ability to set up how you want your users to authenticate, this is again something that we'll configure in the settings tab, but I wanted to give you an idea of what that looks like from a pre-authenticated point of view. So now let's dive into the workspace that we have logged into. So here you can see I have authenticated into my workspace. A couple things about my specific workspace. Um, number one, we are logged into a pro team plan. Um, and the second thing is I am the owner of this workspace. So if you're following along in your own workspace, which I encourage you to do, um, you may notice that there is maybe some functionality or some differences between what you see and what I see. Most likely that's related either to the fact that our, we're on a different plan or we have different roles within the workspace. So, but as a owner, as an owner, we'll be able to see everything that is um, that you're able to do and all the settings associated with that. So you can follow along and at least understand how that works. All right, so in today's tour, we're going to focus on three different areas. We'll go through each one of these tabs along the top toolbar here. Then we're going to look at our project side panel on the left hand side. And finally, we'll wrap up by looking at our flyout menu near our username in the bottom left hand corner of our workspace. So let's start with our homepage. This is our homepage. It's the same homepage or landing page that we saw when um, we had pre-authenticated um, into our workspace. So this gives you the ability to introduce your workspace, introduce your members and users to the workspace, um, give them some helpful tips, of, tips about how to navigate through your workspace, you know, what's coming, what's new, stuff like that. And again, we can configure that in our settings tab. So we'll see that again here in a couple minutes. Moving over to our projects tab, this will be a list of all of our groups and projects. So as we look at the screen, um, first thing we do is have the ability to filter our list. So if you're looking for something specific and you have a lot of projects, you can filter your list down. You also have the ability to search by name and you can click on any one of these column headers and um, reorder the list below. So now you'll notice as we're looking at this, we have a number of different groups as well as some standalone projects. So we can identify our groups really easily. They're the ones that have the little folders like Cheryl showed us earlier. Um, if I wanna learn more about the projects within a group, we can see that there are three projects in this group. So I can always expand that and then see the additional projects associated with that group. So now if I click on a specific group, one thing you'll notice is on the right-hand side of our screen, we get the overview panel. So this is just gonna give us an overview about this group. So we'll see the group name, we'll see a summary of how many projects are associated with the group, the number of admins, any pending admins. We can click on the admins tab, and this is where based on our rights, we may have the ability to adjust the visibility of this specific group. Um, if you have a public group, then you can have public and internal projects within this group. If you have an internal group, you can only have internal projects. We'll also see the admin or list of admins that um, are in this group. We can invite a new admin if we would like to from here as well. And then in our settings tab, uh, again, this would be based on your role. You have the ability to change the group name, the description, um, again, adjust the visibility or add a group avatar. Um, so this is how you can just manage your different groups within your projects tab. Now, if we select a specific project, you'll see we still have an overview tab on the right or an overview panel on the right hand side. But now we've got some information that is specific to this project. So here we'll see the project name. We can right from here, click on edit, which would take us over into studio where we could um, add to or edit any of the existing artifacts with this project. We can look at the docs view, which would be that um, external view that would walk through um, all the different articles and documentation about this project. Or we can click on settings based on our rights, which would take us into a, the, our, the project settings and allow us to make adjustments there. We'll see the number of teams that are associated with this specific project. We'll also see um, the information about the project itself. So if there's different versions or branches, we would see that listed here. We'll also see a view of um, the different artifacts associated with this project. And then if we click on the members tab here, again, based on our rights, we have the ability to adjust the visibility of this specific project. Um, we can see the teams, again, that are associated with this project, 
as well as their default role within this project. And then we'll see any additional members that have been added in and their roles within the project. And then at the top here, we have the ability to add a team or a member to this project. So while we're looking at this, you'll also notice that here under the action tab or column, you have some additional buttons associated with each project. So edit in studio, this would be the same as the edit button we see here in the overview tab, it takes you directly into studio so that you can edit this project. The docs view is listed here, again, the same as the, the view docs above. And then we have the pin button. And what this will do is pin it to our pin projects here on the left-hand side. Um, so if I want to remove that, I can remove the pin and that will remove it from my pinned projects to bring it back. Just click on that to bring it back. So that's the information we see in our projects tab. To create a new group, we would go to the upper right hand corner and we can click on the new group button. We can give our group a name. We'll set the visibility of this group. Is it going to be public or internal? We can give it a description if we would like to. And that will create a new group. So here we can see the group has been created. Now, if I want to create a new project, same place, upper right-hand corner, I can click on the new project button. This is going to take me to our create or import a project. A little bit about what we see here on the screen. There are three different projects that we types of projects that we can create. So we can create an API project, a style guide project, or a component library project. Um, for this example, we'll just create an API project. And then on the left-hand side, we have a couple different ways that we can store this project. So are we going to create a web-based or a stoplight project? We can do that here. Or are we going to reference our Git repo? Um, we can create a new project that will push to our Git repo, or we can pull an existing project from our Git repo. So for this example, we'll just do a, a new project. Again, we'll set the visibility of this project. Is it going to be public, internal, or private? And then here we have the ability to add it to a group if we would like to. So for this one, I'm going to go ahead and add it to that group that we just created. So I'm going to add it to Amy's group, and then we'll create that API project. So what's happening right now is the project is getting created, and it's going to open us up directly into Studio, where here I'd have the ability to start adding um, or importing any new models and APIs, Postman collections, anything like that, I can start working on right from here. Um, Cheryl's going to post a link to learn more about um, a tour of the studio interface. So if you're interested in that, definitely check that out. But for today, I'm going to go ahead and head back to our project list. So now we can see Amy's group has one project associated with it. So we can drill down and that's that new project that we just created. Now, let's say you have created a, a new group, but maybe you want to add some of these standalone projects into that group. Again, that's going to allow a little bit easier management and organization of your project list. So let's say we want to add a couple of these projects into the new Amy's group. What I can do is, um, based on the fact that I'm an owner, I can multi-select these projects. And then you'll notice that gives me a little bit additional functionality up here. So I'll click on the Move button. This will allow me to move these into a group that has been created. So I will add those to Amy's group. And then move them. And so we'll see those projects have been moved into our Amy's group. We now see the three and they're listed there. So that's how you can create a new group, create a new project, um, move some projects around. You also have the ability to remove a project from a group if you would like, um, just by clicking on the ellipse button down here, you can remove from the group. So that is our projects tab. Now let's look at our teams tab. So again, Cheryl was telling us a little bit about Teams and how that will make it easier for us, especially when we're onboarding new members. Um, we get those new members um, added to the appropriate team, and that will then give them access to all of the projects that that team is associated with. So it makes it a lot easier to make sure that you're getting your new members um, in the proper teams and then access to the right projects a lot more easily. So as you think about creating your teams, um, there's a number of different 
reasons or types of teams you might create. So you could um, create teams based on their um, what their role is within your organization. So a tech writer team or a DevOps team. You could also create teams based on their role within projects. So you could have an editor's group and viewers group. You can create teams based on internal organizational team names. So however makes the most sense to you, um, you can set those up. But as we look at our Teams tab, again, we have the ability to do some filtering so we can see all the teams or just the teams we're associated with. We can search for a team by name. Um, again, we can click on the headers of the columns and reorganize um, the list below. And then if we select a specific team, you'll notice again, we get the overview tab on the right-hand side. This will tell us a little bit about this specific team. So here we'll see the team name. If we're already a part of this team, we have the ability to leave the team if we would like to. We'll see the team admin, as well as the projects that this team is currently associated with. We can see our member list. And here we also have the ability to invite a new member to this team. And then again, based on our rights, we have the ability to update the team name, the description, or the team avatar. So to create a new team, we'll head again up to the upper right-hand corner and we can click on new team. We'll give our team a name. Again, a description if we would like to. And then we'll always know where we stand to our team limits. So if we're getting close, we can pay attention to that. Um, but once we have that entered, we'll go ahead and create. So now we can see we've got Amy's team listed here. Since I'm the creator, I will be the admin. If I want to add some new people to um, my team, I will come to the members tab. And here, when I click on this, we'll see all of the, the members that currently exist within our workspace. So let's say I want to add Dan and I want to add Cheryl to my team. So I'll choose both of their names. I can select as many as I would like. And then I have the ability to define their team role. So are they going to be a team admin or a team member? I'm going to make them both admins and I'm going to send them that email so that they will know that they've been invited to this team. So now we've got members in our team. We've got a new team listed here. So now let's apply this team now to our project that we created. So if I come back to our projects team, I will come into Amy's project. And when I click on my members tab here, it's going to pull up my list of teams. So I'm going to add Amy's team to this. They will be editors within this project, and I will send that out. So now we can see we have a team associated with our project, and that team will have editing rights within this project. So any project that I now add Amy's team to would be able to access that project based on the role that I give them. So that's how you can create your teams and then add your teams to the associated projects. So now let's take a look at our members tab. Uh, members is just a list of all of the members associated to our workspace. So here we can see the list of all the members. If I need to change an individual user's role, I can click on the role column and make that adjustment right here. Um, as we've seen in the past, we can filter our list. So we can filter based on roles if we're looking for all the owners in our workspace or something like that. We can also search by name. And then you'll notice here, I have the ability to multi-select. And when I do that, I get a couple more um, options that will show up on top here so I can change the role. So maybe you want to adjust the role of a handful of people. You can select all those names and then change their role. Just choose what you want their new role to be, and that would update that. You can also delete members as you need to in bulk like that. You can also approve or deny pending requests. So here you see we have two pending requests, so I could approve or deny those um, in bulk. To invite a new member to our workspace, again, in the upper right-hand corner, we'll click on invite member. Here we would type in the email address. We'll choose their default workspace role. So what their workspace role would be, we'll select that. And then we can send that invite out. They will receive an email inviting them to the workspace. They can click on that link that will give them access. And then once you have new members added, you again can apply those to the appropriate teams, which would give them access to the projects that they need to access. So that covers our projects team and members tabs. So now let's take a look at our settings tab.
So there's a ton of information in settings. We're going to just kind of touch on all of these and kind of what they do from a high level. Um, but workspace settings, we'll start here. So display name, you have the ability to update the, split, the display name. Typically, you would see that in the upper left-hand corner of your workspace. I have a logo applied right now, so you don't see the, the display name. You see my logo instead. Uh, workspace identifier, if you have an elements portal, you can um, associate that to your workspace using that. You can allow or disallow join requests. So um, you can allow members to request access to your workspace at that login screen, or you can set it up um, if you disable this, that the only way to access your workspace would be to receive an invite from an existing member. You can also enable or disable um, daily digest email going to guests. The daily digest email is a high level overview of projects that have had changes made within them. Um, and guests are defined typically as view only users that are external to your organization. So if you want them to receive that email, you can definitely enable this, uh, but typically you'll have that defaulted off. This is also where you come to set up your approved email domains. So making it easier, easier for certain email domains to access your workspace. You can set up an approved email domain here. You can see I have stoplight.io set up and anyone with a stoplight.io email address will automatically be granted access to my workspace with a viewer role. So you can define um, the email domain as well as the default role right here. Automatic style guide conversion, for those of you who are using a Git repo to store your spectral files, um, you can enable or disable the conversion of those spectral files when you import those projects into your workspace. Moving further down, we've got the look and feel. So this is where you can um, adjust the way your, your workspace looks. So first, based on your plan, you may have the ability to remove stoplight branding. Uh, the stoplight branding is found in two places. It's on your browser tab along the top here, and then also in the bottom left-hand corner of your workspace. So you can turn that off and then that would disappear from those two places. You also have the ability to set the theme. Um, you may notice that my uh, project sidebar is dark in color and yours may be a different color. That's because I'm just using the dark setting here. There, ha there are a number of different presets that you can play with. You also have the ability, if you would like to use your organizational colors to make that match um, you, the rest of your organizational websites and stuff like that, you can define those different colors right in here as well. You can add a favicon which is found on your browser tab. That's a little icon on your browser tab or the logo. As you see here, I've got a logo. In the look and feel is also where you would come to customize that landing page. So we can click on this and here that will open up our edit screen to, to update our homepage. Um, you can write in stoplight flavored markdown. There's also a toolbar here to help make it a little bit easier for you. Um, if you don't wanna start from scratch, totally understandable. You can use the default template. So you can use what we see here. You have the ability to preview. So you could make a change, make a change and then have the ability to see that before you save it, which would then publish it out to um, your home pages, both um, your authenticated and pre-authenticated home pages. So that's the one thing to keep in mind as you're, you're writing this is um, anyone who has access to um, your workspace will be able to see that page. All right, moving down to the doc settings, you have the ability to enable or disable try it, mock servers and search engine indexing. So you can do that right through here. This is also where you come to set up your custom domain. So if you want to allow users to access your workspace via a vanity URL, you'd come and configure that here. If you do set up a custom domain that does give you the ability to um, set up some analytics, so you could use your Google Tag Manager here. You'll also set your redirects. You can hide the sign-in button. And if you have a custom domain, you can do some translation work on your website that does require a um, integration with a third party called Localize that once you've got that subscription set up, you can add your um, key here and that would allow you to do that translation. Below that, we've got our Stoplight API. So if you do want to set up um, some of that automation between your CICD pipeline and your workspace, you would come in here to create your workspace token and then you can use that to set up that automation.
And finally, we've got the integration section. So there's two things we will configure here in the integration section. First is how do we want to allow our users to authenticate into our workspace? So we can use our Git repo. Um, if we're setting up um, single sign-on, we've got LDAP or SAML. Um, so that you would configure here. This is also where you would set up your um, Git repo integration. So when you, if you remember back to that pre-authenticated um, screen that we started on, when we clicked on the sign in, we had three options. We had GitLab, GitHub, and email. You can see Bitbucket did not display because that was disabled and I didn't have um, the rest of these enabled at all. So those won't show up. Um, so if something's disabled, you won't even see it on that initial login screen. And then if we do want to configure our um, GitLab, for example, we can use a default configuration or set up the customization, and that will allow us to uh, push and pull changes directly into our GitLab or GitHub, Bitbucket Cloud, whichever we set up. So this is where you'd come to set all that up, um, enable how you want your users to be able to log in or not. Um, so all of that is done through the integrations. Now, typically settings you come to initially is you're setting up your workspace and then you don't visit a whole lot unless you wanna make a change to that. Um, so one of the things is you do come back to your settings tab. If there's something that you want to better understand before you start setting it up, you'll see that there are some learn more um, options on our screen. Also, if you click on some of those flyout menus, you'll see learn more there. If you click on that, that's going to take you out to our documentation portal where you can learn more about that specific um, functionality. So it will walk you through how to get that set up, anything that you should be aware of, trouble, troubleshooting tips, all of that can be found out on the document, documentation site. So just keep in mind, if you want to learn more about something, you can do that right from that learn more link. All right, so now let's look at our governance tab. So lots of great information here in our governance tab. Um, again, as we look at this, um, we now have the ability to kind of review our different projects and the style guides that are associated to each project right from our governance tab. You still have the ability to manage that individually on a project level, but here now we kind of get a, a more holistic view of all of our different projects and what style guides are associated with each one of those projects. One thing to keep in mind is as you um, create new style guides or um, enable new style guides to be added to your workspace, um, any existing projects will not have that new style guide added to them automatically that will for any project going forward. But this is where you can come in and see like what pro or what style guides are associated with each project. And if we need to add some style guides to a project, we can easily do that through here. So now let's say if I wanted to add some style guides to these two projects, I could multi-select those. And now I have the ability to manage those style guides right from here. So I can easily add some new style guides to existing projects by coming right in here and selecting those. I can enable it. And then if I save that, we'll see those two projects will get that style guide or the number of style guides that I select will be enabled within that project. So again, you can much more easily manage your st applied style guides on each project right from your governance tab. And we still have the ability in the default style guide settings to come in and um, define what we want as our base style guides for all new projects that get created. Um, so again, we can enable those. If we want to learn more about a specific um, style guide, we can click on the view docs and that will take us out to our API style book where we can um, review all of the different rules that are associated with this particular um, style guide to better understand what it is. So all of that we can define in here. And again, you have the ability here if you would like to, to allow admins and editors um, to disable the default style guides. If you want to do that, you can enable that. Otherwise, if you leave it as is, all of your uh, defined style guides, your enabled style guides here would apply to any new project that gets created. So that is our governance tab. Next to that is our activities tab. Think of this as an audit log. Um, there are a number of different events that get added to our activities tab. So we can see those here. Um, yep, basically an audit log. Next to that is our automation. So this, if we are associated to a Git repo, we would see our webhooks listed here. So if you're having any issues, you can come in here, review your, 
your different webhooks, see if there's some errors. You can you can delve into that and hopefully do some troubleshooting and um, get that resolved. And then the final tab we have is our billing tab. This is just going to give us a summary of our workspace plan. So here again, we can see I'm on a pro team plan. Um, the important things to note here are our seat usage and workspace usage. So we'll always know where we stand to any limits that we might have. So if we're pushing up against that, um, we can make an adjustment as needed. So that's all of the information in the tabs along the top. Lots of great information there. So now let's look at what we have access to in our project sidebar here. First thing you'll notice is where your display name or logo is. It looks clickable, so you can click on that. That's another way to take you back to your home screen. So um, you can click on the home button here, the home button here, or up by your display name. Any of them will take you back to the kind of the beginning where you can start again. Next to that, you'll notice there is a plus sign. That is the create a new project um, button. So if we click on that, it takes us right back to creating or importing a project. It's the same that we saw when we clicked on projects and new project, just a quick access way to get to that. Below that, we have a search feature. This is a word search. So if you're looking for something specific, you could type that in and it will pull up any, um, any of those matches here where you can delve in directly from your search results. We've got the home button, which we already talked about. The explore button, um, Similar to the search, only Explore allows you to just see everything, all of the projects that are associated to your workspace and kind of in one window. So you can scroll through everything that's out here. You can delve into the different projects and um, APIs and really get into each one of the um, different docs and rules associated with that. So all of that is viewable right here from within the Explore window. Um, so it's nice if you're newer to a workspace trying to get a better understanding of what is out there, you can always use the explore feature. Below that is proposals. Again, if you are associated to a Git repo, your proposals will show you um, any changes that are taking place within your different projects. One thing to note is right now you see I only have one um, proposal listed here. If I click in the box that says state all, um, I can deselect show only pin projects. So this will default to on, which means I'm only going to see changes to any of the projects that are listed here in my pinned projects. So if I want to see everything, I can select that. And then I would see all of the changes within any project, whether it's pinned on my sidebar or not. Um, so as we look at this, you have the ability to delve into each one of these changes. You can learn um, what the change is, what the effects are. So you can click through all of that information right through here. So it's a great way to kind of have an idea of what's changing within your workspace and what's um, being pushed out to your uh, Git repos. Below that, you've got your recent projects. So it's just going to show you the last four projects that you've accessed. So making it a little bit easier if you're hopping back and forth between a few different projects, you'll see those here. We talked about our pin projects and how to get those here. One thing to note about pin projects is that is unique for each individual. So every one of your users can have their own pin projects, making it easy for them to access um, those projects that either they want to reference easily or um, maybe they're working on a handful of them and they want to keep those listed there. It's easy for them to pin them and then always have access to that. And finally, invite to workspace. This is the same invite to workspace that we saw when we were in the members tab. So again, like we see with the plus button to create um, to create a new project, we can invite members to our workspace right from our quick access toolbar, just as we saw earlier. So that is the information we have access to in our project sidebar. So let's wrap up by looking at um, what we have access to in our flyout menu. So first we have account settings. So if I need to make any changes specifically to my account, I can do that. Um, unsubscribe from the Daily Digest. If I need to update a password, I can do that. I'll also see what accounts I am connected to right in there. Next in our flyout menu, we have access to product docs. So if you're looking for something um, more general and you want to better understand something, you can come in here. You can search our documentation platform for whatever it is you might want to learn more about. So based on Cheryl's recommendation, I'm going to look for workspace rules so I can better understand those. 
Um, so that will do just a simple word search, and that will take me right to the documentation that talks about our workspace roles. Um, so again, easy way to get in and better understand the tool itself. And if you're looking for something specific, you can do that right from the product docs. Below that, we've got our Stoplight blog. Um, if you want to learn more about Stoplight or just APIs in general, it's a great resource. There's lots of great um, blog posts and um, webinar recordings that are out there. So a great reference tool if you're ever looking for that. There's also our help articles. So if you're trying to troubleshoot something and getting stuck, you can always check out our help articles there. And based on your plan, you may have the ability to contact support. So if you want to do that right from within your workspace, you'll just click on contact support. You'll get the thank you for reaching out screen. If this is your first time um, trying to contact support, what will happen right now is an email is being generated and sent to your email box that will allow you to configure your credentials. So when you get to this, you'll wanna go check your email, um, fill out the credentials and then come back. And when you see the screen the second time, then you'll just click here. And then anytime going forward, just click here. That will take you out to the support portal where you can log in. Um, from there, you can open new support cases, review existing support cases, there's also links to additional helpful information out on the support portal. So check that out when you have a minute. Underneath contact support, we've got access to the release notes. You can see any new changes that have been pushed out to your SaaS environment will be listed there. And then as well, access to the roadmap. Um, so if you wanna see kind of what is being worked on as far as new features that are coming into um, your stoplight workspace, you can check that out. You can also, if you have an idea for something that would be really helpful, you can submit new feature requests right from within the roadmap. So that kind of wraps up what we have access to in our flyout menu, as well as our project side panel and each one of the tabs along the top. Again, it's tons of information, um, but as you start to work through your workspace, you'll learn um, where everything is and hopefully this will make it simpler to to get your workspace up and running and get your members added quickly. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it back over to Cheryl, who will wrap us up. Thank you, Amy. So as a reminder, we have posted a number of helpful articles in the chat window. So if you've not had a chance to copy those, please feel free to do that now. And as we wrap up, I would like to uh, quickly review the Stoplight subscription plan options. You can leverage a selection of software as a service subscription options that are fully hosted by Stoplight for your API design, mocking, documentation, and governance building blocks. With Stoplight's basic plan, you can begin working with interactive docs and mocking servers, allowing you to collaborate with up to three seats. Moving up to the Stoplight startup plan, your subscription includes eight seats, who can collaborate on up to 10 projects and it unlocks an approved email domain and custom workspace domain features within your workspace, allowing you to use your own host name to access your Stoplight hosted API design and documentation. You can also purchase additional seats as needed. By leveling up to the pro team plan, your subscription includes 15 seats on up to 100 projects along with 20 teams. And again, you can purchase additional seats as needed. The pro team plan also unlocks additional single sign-on uh, options, as well as SAML and LDAP, additional Git provider options, and GitHub, or such as GitHub Enterprise and Azure DevOps server, custom domain features within your workspace. The pro teams also offers access to the discussions feature to help you build collaboration when designing your APIs, along with the access to our component libraries and our brand new catalog API functionality. Lastly, Stoplight's enterprise plan includes unlimited projects and unlimited teams, and you gain the ability to access volume license discounts when purchasing your user seats. You have additional account invoicing flexibility as well as custom pay terms. And finally, you have enhanced onboarding and training engagements with the customer success team and enhanced priority for your support cases. As a reminder, all of the questions that were posted in the QA section will be added to Discord community in the Connect and Discuss forum with a training tag. 
You will be able to see all those submitted questions and answers there shortly. There has been a link to the Discord channel posted in our chat session. And that wraps up our training session for today. So be sure to mark your calendars for the next Training Thursday session on September 14th. Live Training Thursdays are scheduled for the second Thursday of each month. For additional webinars with our marketing team, please see our website for more details. Be sure to uh, check out the Learn with Stoplight webinars playlist for recordings of our previous Stoplight training sessions. Those can be found in YouTube by searching Learn with Stoplight webinars. You can also search for the How To playlist for short trainings to learn a little bit more about the specific functions. And we're going to stay on for another minute or so to allow for any additional questions. And with that, we thank you and have a wonderful day.